Hi. So a little bit about me. My name is Boris. Um, I'm currently an Oslo-based artist. Um, I work with kind of merging art and, te art and technology. Um, and uh, previously, I actually talked at uh, Closure West um, a couple of years ago. And I spoke about wearable technology and closure. Um, this was the kind of the culmination of that project. And I've done a couple of other um, wearable sensor driven projects uh, since then. And that's one of my um, main areas of interest. Um, another one of my areas of interest is actually uh, generative art and also looking at um, algorithms in general, critiquing them, uh, using them, and also converting them um, uh, into some kind of um, artistic purpose. And uh, today I will talk about a project called uh, Machines That uh, Judge Us. And uh, this was created during an artist's residency called Summer Sessions. Um, it happens uh, every year, I believe, uh, in the Netherlands uh, at uh, the V2 lab for the Unstable Media. It's actually one of the oldest art and technology research centers, labs, creation spaces um, in the world. And uh, I got uh, very fortunate because it was, um, I was sent there by PNEC, which is the Norwegian network for electronic artists. And um, they were very helpful with making this uh, possible. Um, so what is this project about? Um, I've been looking at a way to kind of bring out the invisible areas of how um, technology is taking part uh, in our lives today. Um, and often uh, there are things that happen because we do things or because things, things, things think we do things, um, but we don't necessarily have a very clear um, idea about that. And uh, one of uh, my favorite recent quotes um, is this one. And what, I'm, what interests me in this is that we are effectively um, creative so creating software in contexts and in places and in locations, uh, whether that may be remote or otherwise. Um, and uh, that really brings um, other layers that we don't really discuss very much. Um, and what could that be? So for there are some assumptions that I made that I believe in um, in the process of starting this project. Um, and one of them is that software cannot be produced without containing like aspects of the biases of its creators. So, and that may be cultural biases, racial biases, um, and things that are, uh, we are quite aware of or we're quite not aware of. Um, and another thing is um, <laughs> we, we often talk about this in various uh, ways, uh, sometimes fondly, sometimes negatively. Um, and uh, a lot of software is created in these modes where we want to create a, the minimal viable product, we want to ship it, we want to see if there is adoption. This is kind of our often, especially on a corporate level, uh, validation method. So how do you validate your product? Often you have to ship it. And uh, that is also often by any means necessary. Um, so kind of break, uh, moving fast and breaking things as the famous quote goes. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail into, we, I think a lot of us are already quite aware about these issues and we have been discussing them for a few years now. Um, uh, I will bring up one uh, thing that happened really recently uh, and I just couldn't not uh, enjoy this. But so the funny thing here is that often this is a very um, humorous moment. We're kind of looking at this and we're like, oh great, this, um, this, uh, this machine is quite dumb. It, it made a stupid mistake. And we have this attitude. We have this attitude that, oh, it's a computer. You know, it is, it's not human. <laughs> it's going to make silly um, uh, issues. But um, what uh, really happened here is that a human was directly charged with a crime um, by a uh, machine that was confident in its decision making. When we look at those confidence gradients in our various tools and so on, um, we often start to accept values that are quite uh, 
well, would maybe be unacceptable in many other industries. Like, oh, it's, it's uh, you know, 60% confident, therefore <laughs> we can start making choices. Um, and uh, I think that highlights an interesting problem where we uh, have various attitudes, and, and not just we as software developers, but we as a public, where it's like often it is a ha-ha moment when you get an ad served to you that is completely silly. Um, and you're like, this has nothing to do with me. And here's like, you know, billions of research dollars being spent on advertising, tracking algorithms and all of this magic. Um, but if we go back a step, then these billions of dollars are also being spent on making legal systems. And uh, we all know that there are many uh, racially biased legal systems in America today. Um, and by systems, I do mean software as there are many other biased systems. Um, but we still end up coming to this point as a public, uh, like what a stupid machine. We don't feel often, unless we are directly targeted. I'm sure um, she thought that this was uh, a little bit more than a stupid machine. Um, but we don't feel very angry very often when we're served the wrong advertisement, when we're giving the wrong um, uh, result on our search. Um, and what I'm hoping to create is a more visceral relationship between the devices that make judgments for us. Um, so, um, and uh, how am I doing that? Before I continue, I want to uh, acknowledge that um, Anthony Grimes passed away um, over a year ago now, but um, uh, his work in the community has literally made a lot of my stuff very possible. And um, I just really want to um, acknowledge that. Um, so what did I make? I created uh, three of these beautiful uh, objects. I use beautiful loosely. Um, and uh, I was going to uh, set them up here, but I realized that they're really small and it's not really made for a conference talk environment. But if you want to check it out, I'm available afterwards and I can go through the hardware and look at it. Um, but essentially, well, I'll describe it. And um, I won't go too far into the technical details. It's not a very complicated um, project, so I'm not teaching you software very much. Um, but essentially, I have three devices that do very standard computer vision. Um, and they look at face detection recognition, as well as um, a gender and age, what I call assumption. <laughs> um, and uh, they communicate with each other via HTTP on a little local network. And then in uh, Clojure, I'm actually running a bunch of various things. Um, the most important of which, of which is a dialogue system um, and uh, a little bit of a, a visual element. So what is, um, what is happening? So the first thing is there's a tiny little smartphone style camera that detects faces in a room much like this one. And when you enter the room, it just picks somebody at random that it sees. Um, it tries to, uh, it makes an assumption on their age and gender. Um, and uh, after that, um, we go into the voice system and there is a set of dialogue that is then chosen and constructed dynamically based on um, those parameters. Um, and then uh, once that is done, text-to-speech does its thing and voila, you have a, a a thing that happened. Um, so the quick uh, demo here. Um, so this is essentially what happens. And if we have audio, which uh, disappeared, sorry. It's because it's not outputting to the right speaker. Um, hey, this young one looks rich. Juicy. Juicy indeed. I can almost taste how deep those pockets must be. So the second machine has a kind of response and then... Uh, Let's see how we can get it stuck with a massive loan. And so it pieces this together based on... Um, and, and, and often this provides a, a, a kind of a humorous experience. Um, but it's essentially uh, what I'm uh, thinking about with this is not just 
translating the, the logic that these machines follow, like verbatim, but also thinking about the, the intent. Because the, the logic might actually uh, be quite basic and generic, you know, age greater than and so on. But really what it's saying is that if somebody is too old, maybe they're not worthwhile. Or if somebody is of a certain gender, maybe they are also not worthwhile. Or if they are worthwhile, then it's only because we can get something out of them. And so this is kind of the, the, the area that I'm interested in, in exploring is that um, what if we were given giving voices, human voices or human actors to actually speak on the behalf of the decisions that we make as software developers? Would we be comfortable with those decisions being made? How would we, um, how would we uh, react ourselves? Um, and also, would we be comfortable with kind of role playing that out and actually coming up to an individual and tracking them as we, we might do in our software um, and then seeing what their response to this is or how we sound. And often what I found is that um, people respond to this in very different ways. But one of the issues, one of the things that comes up is surprise. It, it's surprise at how often this sounds malicious. How often this, this voice or, or this persona or character would play the villain in our movies. And, uh, and I think that it's an interesting exercise to work through, to actually go in and um, look at how we write our algorithms and design our software. Um, it's also an interesting exercise in terms of how bias can be actually uh, revealed, because uh, as individuals, we often cannot always help how our initial approach is. That is not necessarily built into us at all times, which means we need to consider it um, in addition to our standard development process. We can't just uh, go with what feels completely natural, always, because that could possibly mean that you're bringing your cultural context into the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, so this is kind of the key question that I'm, I'm, I want to pose here, is um, what... Uh, yeah, if you were if you were working with this, um, what would you? Um, yeah, how would you feel about your work, um, output? Um, the just as a quick uh, closure reintroduction, um, there are a couple of things that I uh, that ma made closure really useful for me, and um, as a as an artist, I often combine many different things that I find. So for one, um, I really wanted to use uh, open software for as much of this. I'm aware that there are online APIs that do a lot of facial recognition and uh, related activities. There was even, um, uh, I'm not going to mention the company, but there was a company that was doing um, uh, essentially facial recognition for things like ethnicity. and. Uh, they closed that API uh, a year ago or a few years ago, and uh, they have a very noble statement on their website where that API was, where they're saying, oh, we are, you know, we want to be at the forefront of, you know, proper software, and we want to say that, uh, uh, yeah, by closing this, we are such good, nice people. Um, and in a way, that's true, but in another way, it's also a little bit funny in that they spent quite a bit of time developing this technology uh, first. And it took them uh, possibly public backlash or other uh, external incentives to actually can that probably very expensive project. Um, and so I didn't want to provide data from people visiting my exhibition uh, to any third party. And so I decided to use uh, the tiny Raspberry Pi processors to do as much of the computer vision as I could. Um, but also use open source, source software in order to say that um, when we build open source software, we, we are often doing a very noble thing. We are allowing people to create things um, that they would normally not be able to do. People like me. I would not be able to make this project if all of this was behind corporate walled gardens. 
But at the same time, it doesn't excuse us from um, uh, the biases that we're bringing to this. Um, and uh, as much as it's uh, often stated that uh, all software is uh, created neutral and all of this other stuff, um, that may be true in some ways. Um, but uh, in other ways, it's also um, uh, we should keep all of this in mind. Um, and uh, finally, this also means that anybody can do this, uh, essentially. Just like the promise of open source software, anybody can come in and they can create a product based on uh, this computer vision technology. I'm just using OpenCV. Um, and so somebody can bring this up. They can put this out. They can put it on their billboards. They can put it onto the software that um, detects people jaywalking. And maybe they did. Um, and that also brings a certain level of responsibility on, on us because um, essentially we, at some point, we made decisions that said it is okay for this to be this accurate or it's up to the user to make the choice of how, um, how accurate they're going to allow their uh, device to be. Um, and whether, so um, that was another thing that I wanted to mention. Um, Finally, I wanted to bring up a couple of libraries. I don't know um, if anyone has used uh, Clojure 2D. Um, it kind of sneakily came out maybe a, a year or two ago. Um, and uh, it doesn't aim to like replace Quill or anything in the 2D graphics land. Um, but it has an incredible amount of work behind it. And it seems to be relatively unknown still. Um, I was able to really quickly set up a couple of other projects with it. And here, um, I added the um, kind of the, the face, sorry, the display. So this is actually what happens uh, in the space. Uh, when one of these devices detects you, there is a kind of a screen in the corner so that you can see who you are, who the device is talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a, a pleasure to work with. Um, yeah, and uh, I okay. have oh, lots of time. So if you have questions, please um, ask. <laughs>